Good morning, MCBC. I'm Pastor Joanne, MCBC's children's pastor. Welcome to worship. So today's call to worship comes from Psalm 51, verse 10, which says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Right now, I'd like you to think about whether or not you come to worship this morning with a right spirit. Have you put away all distractions? Are you here to be invested in your faith community, your church family, your brothers and sisters in Christ? Have you come to give all of yourself to Christ in response to what he's already given to you? Today, let's worship our Lord with clean hearts and right spirits. blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name my hope is built on nothing less then Jesus blood in righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but only trust in Jesus name in Christ the Savior's love through 
my Savior leads me. Who if I to ask beside? How could I doubt His tender mercy? Who through life has been my guide? All the way my Savior leads me And cheers each winding path I tread And gives me grace for every trial Feeds me with the living bread
Hello, friends at Markham Chinese Baptist Church. Uh, my name is Alvin. I work with the Canadian Baptist of Ontario, Quebec, and it is an honor to be able to share with you and worship with you this morning. Uh, as some of you might know, today on October the 17th, this is CBLQ Sunday. Uh, whether you realize it or not, you are actually part of a family of churches that span over 330 plus congregations, worshiping in at least 20 different languages right now. And so this is one Sunday when we get a chance to, to look back and see what does it mean to be part of CBOQ. And so hopefully you'll get a chance uh, to see a little bit more of that at another time. But for today, we wanted to dive into our passage, which is Nehemiah chapter 2. Uh, what's interesting is, is that the passage that we're looking at actually ties back to a sermon that I actually shared here a few weeks ago. And so if you wanted to look at that one again, that was, I believe that was hosted on September the, September the 19th. And so I invite you, if you want, take a look at that sermon later on and see how these two tie in. And so just a quick little recap here, because if we go back to Ezra chapter 4, we read about how there was opposition not just to the temple being rebuilt, but to the Jerusalem itself being rebuilt up. And we have a little bit of history that's being shown here. There's actually a letter that goes to King Artaxerxes uh, in that he basically writes back and says, yes, you know what? Uh, I hear what you're saying to the people who wrote this letter, and I want you to stop the work that the, that the Israelites are doing, that the remnant who came back from the exile are doing. And so that's the context that we see this passage in. Because Nehemiah receives this calling, we read in chapter 1, and now we go into chapter 2. And between that time, from when Nehemiah first receives that calling from God to rebuild the wall, into chapter 2, about four months have passed. At this stage, uh, it's around, so scholars have suggested it's around March or April of 40, 444 BC. And so Nehemiah, through those four months, has had this heaviness in his heart. He senses what God is calling him towards. He's heard about what Jerusalem is like. And he has this yearning to go back to help rebuild what was established there before. And so in verse 1, that's where we start off as. Let's read it together, shall we? In the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. In verse 2, And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. So as this heaviness is weighing on Nehemiah, as he's feeling the weight of God's call, but also almost this, maybe even this fear of, of this paralysis of not being able to do something about it. He, it's, it's something that is overcoming him to the point where now he's physically expressing it. And the thing is, is that when you went into the presence of the king, in a lot of ways, the king doesn't have to care how you feel. The king doesn't have to care what you think. He wants you to behave in a certain way in a way that makes him feel comfortable. And so when Nehemiah, who's essentially one of the cupbearers, brings the wine to King Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes sees this. And there's something about Artaxerxes that maybe doesn't get reflected back in Ezra, in Ezra chapter 4. Because Ezra chapter 4, when we read about that, it seems like, ne it seems like King Artaxerxes is saying, you know what? Uh, we're, we're going to put a clamp on this. We're going to stop this thing that's happening in Jerusalem. And yet when Artaxerxes sees Nehemiah, someone that he actually shows care for, he says to him, well, why, why do you look sad? And of course, Nehemiah is afraid. Because again, you don't approach the king looking gloomy. You don't, you don't trouble the king with your problems. But Artaxerxes shows he actually cares. So let's keep going. Verse for three. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? It's interesting how here in verse three, Nehemiah stresses the emotional attachment he has to a place. And the king can understand that. Artaxerxes understands this idea of, this emotional tie you have to a place of significance. And so, and especially as a place of your ancestry. And notice here that Nehemiah doesn't say, Jerusalem is in ruins. He says, this is a place that is dear to me. It's a place where, you know, it's a place where uh, my, uh, my father's graves. 
right? It's a place where the city gates was usually once one of the most important parts of the city is destroyed. It's like as if it's it's destitute, and it breaks Nehemiah's heart. What I find interesting to hear is is that Artaxerxes in his in verse four, this is what he says. Then the king said to me, "What are you requesting?" Artaxerxes here begins to to note, well, if this is something that matters to you, then what would you like to do about it? Right? And if we read in the second part of verse 4, this is what it says. So I prayed to the God of heaven. I think Nehemiah already had an idea of what he wanted to request. It wasn't like he went in there bl- blindly. It wasn't like he went in there not knowing what, he, what steps he wanted to take. In fact, earlier it said that he was afraid. I think part of the reason why he was afraid was he knew what he wanted. He knew what he wanted to ask. But just like Esther, as you might read about in the book of Esther, just like when she approached the king, when Nehemiah now approaches the king, he realizes he can't just blurt out a request. You can't just say what he wants to do. But the king is drawn in. The king cares. And so he asked, well, what's your request? And, and Nehemiah here, it says that he took a moment to pray. Let's stop there for a second. He took a moment to pray. He knew what he wanted to do. But even before he asked, in, even when the king said, well, what is your request? Nehemiah decided to take just a moment. It wasn't a long, drawn-out prayer. But it was just a moment for him to look back to God and say, okay, and to ask. Is this the way? Is this what you want? That may your will be done. I mean, one of the things that Nehemiah does is he keeps on looking back. He double checks to, to in that prayer to verify that God is sending him. That God is the one who initiated the vision, this desire, and that Nehemiah prays to the God of heaven that. It might move forward the way that God would want. I don't know if there's a decision you're trying to make right now. Maybe there's something that's, you know, that, that's, that's burdening you. Maybe something that's a, a deep desire. In the midst of that, one of the things we have to ask, we have to check back regularly. Okay, God, are you sending me forward this way? Are you moving me forward in this direction? And so it's good for us to ask. Just like Nehemiah here, after the king had asked, what is your request? He takes a moment to pray. Let's move on to verse 5. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I, when I had given him a time. Now, it's interesting here, right? In verse 5, because Nehemiah makes this request. Can I go back to the capital of Judah to rebuild the city? Now, Scripture doesn't tell us what, what exactly is going through Artaxerxes' mind at this point. But I do wonder, did he make the connection? Did he realize that Jerusalem, the place that when we read about in Ezra chapter 4, he basically says, stop rebuilding. And now Nehemiah comes with his request. So what changes here? What's different? Perhaps the fact that when he first gets that letter in Ezra chapter 4, Artaxerxes thing doesn't even make that connection. He just hears about a place that seems to, that, that might actually cause a problem for him. And he says, okay shut it down. But then when someone that he cares about all of a sudden has an emotional connection to this place, he has a change of heart. He now actually says, okay, go and rebuild it. It's funny sometimes, right? Those moments, even when you might look back and you realize, it, you know, when we talk about certain events or we talk about certain circumstances, when it's very abstract, we, we feel very, we seem almost disconnected. We don't actually have uh, this, 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 this connection into that situation. Talk about almost any kind of issue, whether it's about vaccinations, whether it's about certain kind of 
socioeconomic circumstance. Whatever the case may be, a lot of times when we think in the abstract of those people, we might have one certain way that we want to approach it. But then when there's a deeper emotional connection, when it's someone that we care about in that similar circumstance, we have more empathy. We actually have this, this emotional connection to that situation where it might actually help us to get a better idea of what that person's going through, even if we may not necessarily agree with the exact circumstance they're going through or how to approach that circumstance. And so what I also find interesting is, is that, you know, in Ezra chapter four, it seems like Artaxerxes is the enemy. It seems like he is the one who's opposing. And yet when we get to here in Nehemiah chapter two, it seems like all of a sudden Artaxerxes is, is actually not an enemy, but an ally. And so maybe that asks, begs one of the questions sometimes when we're moving ahead, when we sense that God is sending us, when we know God is sending us, and we sense a resistance and opposition, do we actually identify it properly? Do we actually know what or who the opposition is in the first place? It reminds me of that one video clip in Men in Black, and we're going to show it right here. This is when uh, Will Smith's character, Jay, is recruited. He goes through a series of tests, and this is one of the final tests in that. So take a look at this. Hesitated. May I ask why you felt little Tiffany deserved to die? Well, she was the only one that actually seemed dangerous at the time, sir. How'd you come to that conclusion? Well, first I was going to pop this guy hanging from the street light, and then I realized, you know, he's just working out. And how would I feel somebody come running in a gym, bust me in my while I'm on a treadmill? Then I saw this uh, snarling beast guy, and I noticed he had a tissue in his hand. I realized, you know, he's not snarling. He's sneezing. You know, ain't no real threat there. Then I saw a little Tiffany. I'm thinking, you know, eight-year-old white girl, middle of the ghetto, bunch of monsters, this time of night with quantum physics books. She's about eight years old. Those books are way too advanced for her. If you ask me, I'd say she's up to something. And to be honest, I'd appreciate it if you eased up off my back about it. I mean, sometimes at a quick glance, we think we know who the opposition is. But until you take a deeper look, then we begin to identify who's actually an ally, and who's in opposition. And so let's keep moving on here in verse 7. This is what it says. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. And so Nehemiah makes very clear what exactly he needs. First of all, he wants to make sure that others are aware, especially after that first letter that Artaxerxes sent out in, in Ezra chapter 4. He wants to make sure that the, the people that he's about to encounter, the people, the group of people who actually oppose the rebuilding of Jerusalem, he wants them to know that actually the king has now granted permission for this, that he's not doing this rogue. He's not just going off on his own, that he actually has the king's authority to do this. And then he asks for letters uh, for, to use the lumber from the king's forest. And really, this, is the, this has been, uh, scholars have said that this is the, the cedars of Lebanon. If you look at some of the, the trees that are part of uh, Lebanese cedar, that they are big, right? They are huge. The, four, the trees that are outside Jerusalem are much shorter in comparison. And so, and so Nehemiah realizes that in order to rebuild the, the walls properly, he's going to need these big, giant timber. And so he asks for those supplies. And the king grants him that. And so now he's off. Let's read verse 9. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river, that is the trans-Euphrates, 
and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers and the army of the army and horsemen. But when Sambalid the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. And so here in verse 10, we're introduced to two other people, Sambalid and Tobiah. Sambalid was later on referred to as the governor of Samaria. If you look at a map of where Samaria is in relation to Jerusalem, they're pretty close to each other. And so when, when Nehemiah and his cavalry are coming through on their way to Jerusalem, as they pass through Samaria, Sambala is recognizing that this guy seems like he's a threat. Rebuilding Jerusalem is a threat. In fact, this, this tension has been there for so long. This tension was there when the kingdom of David was divided into two. This tension existed later on, even in Jesus' time. You might remember that in John chapter 4, right? when Jesus meets a Samaritan woman. Because this tension is there of who, who exactly there are the people of God. Right? And so Sambala recognizes this, at least in his mind, this is not good. And Tobiah, who actually some scholars suggest that he comes from a very influential, very wealthy family. And so he seems to be like a, side, like a sidekick or a subordinate to Sambalad. And so both of them recognize that this is a threat. Let's keep reading here in verse 11. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I rose in the night, I and a few men with me. And I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me, but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. I then went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate, and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were about to do the work. So as we just read, Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem. And now he wants to take a look exactly what needs to be done. He has an idea what needs to be done. He's heard the stories. He's heard about the reports. But now he wants to see for himself. He has an idea of what needs to be done, but will his plan actually work? And so he, at night, when he goes to take a look, he goes without fanfare. He goes without distraction. He takes a few people with him. And he kind of starts from the western part of where the walls are. And he heads down south and around. And as he takes a look, especially when it says that he gets under, when he gets towards the pool, in verse 14, when it says that there was no room, part was because the walls were so destroyed when the Babylonians came to take over earlier, that it was so desecrated, so destitute in that area that his donkey couldn't even get by. And so now he knows what needs to be done. He has a clear idea now of what has to happen. And so this is what we read about now in verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. And also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. As Nehemiah is giving these instructions to the people, he reminds them that this isn't just his plan. This is God's plan. Nehemiah knows who sent him and what he sent him for. But also now we read in verse 19, we recognize who the enemy is. But when Sambala the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Jessam the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper. 
and we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. So Nehemiah is very clear here. He knows who sent him. He knows that it is the God of heaven who has sent him to commission and commissioned him to rebuild Jerusalem's walls. But then he also recognizes who is the actual opposition. Because if you went back to, again, as we said, with Ezra chapter 4, you would have thought that Artaxerxes is the opposition. In fact, here, you know, Symbolid and Tobiah and Jessam suggest, are you rebelling against the king? And Nehemiah makes it very clear. It's not the king that we're rebelling against. But we recognize that these three are the opposition to Jerusalem. And so what exactly can we take away from this story? Might I suggest a couple of things? The first one is this, is that it is helpful. In fact, it is diligent for us to regularly check back with God and and to recognize whether he is the one who is still sending us. There are times when maybe we think he's sending us. And if you're just basing it off of one call or one moment, that may not be enough. Recognize here that there are several times when Nehemiah prays when Nehemiah recognizes God's hand in the moment, he recognizes where God is leading him. He knows who has sent him. But then who exactly is opposing him? And I think sometimes this is one of the things that we need to be conscious of. We might think we know who our opposition is, but maybe who we think our opposition is is not actually the opposition. You know, think back to what what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so sometimes we might think we know who the opposition is, and yet maybe we need to step back and look a little bit deeper. Right now, one of the biggest contentious issues that's that surrounding our GTA neighborhoods is this, is all is about vaccinations. You know, some people want everyone to get the vaccination. Others who are hesitant, maybe even very much opposed to getting the vaccinations. Sometimes even within some of our church communities, we are having these divides. And I know there are moments when maybe we look at another person and sometimes we think, well, well how could you even think that way? Right? How could how could you how could you embrace that stance? And all of a sudden, we think that they are the enemy. We think that that person or that group of people is the opposition. And yet, is it? Right now, in this current pandemic, is the opposition those who are either for or against vaccinations, or is there a deeper opposition here? And so, this is one of the questions that we need to ask sometimes. On the one hand, in what God has called both each of us individually, as well as us corporately, what we are called to do. It is good, it is diligent for us to check back and know he who has sent us. But then also to accurately recognize who exactly is the opposition. Where is the opposition actually coming from? And only when we do that, then we can actually begin to see who else do we actually, can we actually work with? You know, who are those that are actually in line with what God's will is? And make no mistake, sometimes we might not have the full picture of what that even means. So even for those of us who are in the church right now, in some churches, vaccinations is the dividing line. And if that's the case then, are we forgetting what our actual mandate is as the body of Christ? Our mandate is to go and make disciples of all nations. Is there a way to potentially still do that, recognizing that this other person may not be the actual opposition? Maybe there's something deeper. And that's one of the things about this passage. And, and as you begin to read later on in the, other pa- in the further readings of Nehemiah and how he begins to handle that opposition, we're not going to dig into that at this time. But you do need to start with that question, with those two questions. God, are you still sending me? Is this still where you want me to go? 
And let's recognize who the actual opposition is. It may not be who we think it is. It is my prayer that you diligently, prayerfully discern what that means. That in whatever God has called you to do right now, as an individual, as a community called Markham Chinese Baptist, that you would diligently check back with God regularly to know whether he is actually sending you or not. And if he is, that you would step faithfully towards that. In the midst of moving forward, that we would also recognize who is the actual opposition. Because maybe it's not who you think it is. And so, let's close off with this prayer, shall we? Father God, we thank you for this day. Father, you are the same today as you were yesterday and as you are tomorrow. Since the beginning, you have sought a relationship with your people to instruct us in the way that we ought to go. Father, today we pray for discernment. We pray that the Holy Spirit that indwells within us will give us the clarity of your call to us. Father, we want to be obedient to your call in our lives. We pray for such discernment to not only make wise choices, but in the course of it all, to follow your guiding hand. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, church. My name is Jonathan. I'm one of the deacons here at MCBC, and here are this week's announcements. Uh, first off, I want to tell you about a ministry need and our Driven Worship Service. We're currently looking for uh, speakers who are willing to come and to share the good news uh, with our youth. If you're interested, please email timothy.vang at mcbc.com uh, for more information. The other announcement I want to tell you about is an exciting event we have for the kids uh, planned for the Fall Festival this year. On October 31st from 2 to 4 p.m., uh, please join us for an opportunity to bake an apple crisp together. It's going to be a fun family event. If you're interested in that, all you have to do is go to the mcbc.com slash en website, and what you'll be able to do is register there so that we can provide you with all the ingredients and the kit that you're going to need in order to follow along. And that's it for this week's announcements. Thank you so much for participating and joining in in this week's service. Looking forward to seeing you guys in person real soon. God bless.